Welcome to everybody. We're thrilled that you joined us for this event today, um, which is going to discuss the new green power for New York City. It's a really exciting subject. This is the first public briefing uh, for this particular subject in New York City, and we're thrilled to have our panelists with us. Uh, before I start, I just want to um, remind everybody of the values that we use at Urban Green of excellence, inclusion, collaboration, and engagement. These values guide our work each and every day, including the programs that we do. And we ask that everybody keep those in mind as we proceed with the program today. So we have an exciting agenda. It's a, a jam-packed agenda today. We're going to start with my colleague, uh, Chris Halfnight at Urban Green, who's going to provide the policy framework and perspective for this topic today. Then we'll have a presentation by uh, Clean Path New York uh, on uh, their exciting investment and, and project to bring clean power into New York City. We'll do a Q&A uh, for that panel, and then we'll come back with a second panel from Champlain Hudson Power Express to talk about their exciting project bringing hydropower into New York. We'll do Q&A for that panel as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Chris Halfnight, the Policy Director at Urban Green, to give us the policy backdrop to today's discussion. Chris, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, John. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Halfnight. I'm Director of Policy at Urban Green. And as John said, I'm just going to give us a very quick uh, primer on the Tier 4 program. So I'm just going to share my screen here with some slides. <clears throat> So tier four sits within the broader New York State clean energy transition. And the guiding force for that transition is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act called the CLCPA, it's state law enacted in 2019. That law includes mandated targets to decarbonize our electricity grid. And those targets are implemented through what's called the clean energy standard. Those targets are to hit 70% renewable electricity by 2030 and 100% clean power, carbon-free electricity by 2040. They are ambitious targets, but the state is moving aggressively to implement and reach those targets. Uh, you can see from the graph on the right here that we are currently operating with about 27% of statewide energy from renewable sources. And there is another 23% already contracted and in the development pipeline a significant amount of that is offshore wind. So that puts us at about 50%. There's another 20% still expected to come in order to reach those that 70 by 30 target. And today's projects are part of that next phase. That statewide picture obscures to a degree the reality that New York is facing a tale of two grids. That's what the grid operator, the New York ISO calls it. And this map is from their most recent Power Trends annual report. So what that means is the northern and western parts of the state or the upstate region have plentiful clean energy. They're operating with about 90% uh, of their energy from clean energy sources. Downstate, we have the opposite. More than three quarters of our electricity is coming from fossil fuels. And actually the number is a little higher that's, than what's on the map uh, right now because the Indian Point nuclear facility is now completely offline. In between these two, between upstate and downstate, we have a transmission bottleneck. Uh, it's very difficult to get that clean energy from upstate to the downstate region where it's needed. And this story is the challenge that's at the heart of the clean energy standard and the projects that we're gonna hear about today. So the clean energy standard has mandated targets, but it also has a number of policy levers to implement and achieve those targets. And the primary lever is renewable energy credits. They, in essence, drive the clean energy standard. So renewable energy credits represent the environmental attributes of one megawatt hour of renewable electricity. They are a commodity that's produced for every megawatt hour of electricity that's produced. A, a credit is also produced, a, a, a renewable energy credit or a REC. And that commodity can be bought and sold and added to the developer's value stack to help make a project pencil out. So it is, in essence, a means of support or subsidy for uh, clean energy development. Under the clean energy standard, NYSERDA procures different types of RECs. There is tier one, which covers new renewables that have gone into service from 2015 or later. There's tier two, 
which covers existing renewables or maintenance renewables that are from before 2015. There is a separate category called OREX for offshore wind energy that's specific to those resources. And now there is this new tier four category that covers New York City renewables. Tier four was created about one year ago in October of 2020 by a public service commission order. It created this new category of REC that is for resources that are in New York City or delivered to New York City through a new transmission interconnection. <clears throat> Those resources include your typical renewables like solar and wind, but they also include hydro that's already built but not yet interconnecting to New York City, which was not previously included in the clean energy standard. So this development, the tier four program is specifically aimed at solving that tale of two grids story I mentioned before and that bottleneck challenge getting clean energy down to the downstate region. The, uh, we are partway through the tier four process. It's not yet finished. So there was a solicitation in January of this year and that resulted in 18 eligibility applications, which then led to seven full project bids and, and all of those bids had multiple configurations. So there were a lot of options for NYSERDA to consider. And then in September, Governor Hochul and NYSERDA announced the winners uh, in the form of recommended contract awards. And those are the two projects that um, we are going to hear from today. The next step is that these recommend, recommended awards go to the Public Service Commission for uh, approval, and there will be a public comment period as part of that process. And then once that approval comes, the projects can begin development, including uh, any necessary permitting still to do and uh, construction. So these two projects that have won the, uh, the, the recommended contract awards from NYSERDA would bring a massive clean energy injection into New York City. NYSERDA is estimating that they would result in about 18 million megawatt hours of annual clean energy production. And that is more than a third of New York City's current annual consumption. So it is a, an absolutely game-changing development. And then just lastly, I want to touch on Local Law 97 very quickly because I think it's probably front of mind for many of you. As, as I think many of you know, Local Law 97 allows renewable energy credits for compliance if the power is in New York City or sinking directly into New York City. That definition aligns very well, very strongly with the tier four criteria. And at the same time, we know that NYSERDA will sell tier four RECs into the voluntary market. The PSC directed them to do so in, in the order. But we don't yet know exactly how these two pieces are going to fit together. And that's because the eligibility details depend on future rulemaking from the New York City Department of Buildings. And that process is, is underway now. So we are awaiting those rules to clarify. So today's focus is not uh, eligibility for Local Law 97 or the questions around that. Stay tuned for future programming on that question as, as it evolves. Instead, we're here to, to learn about the two winning projects and, and the remarkable uh, development they would mean for New York City. So with that, I'm going to uh, welcome the first panel, the team behind the Clean Path New York. So if that team could please turn on your camera, your cameras. Um, we have Luke Falk, who is vice, vice president of Energy Re. We also have Phil Toya, who is president of NYPA Development at the New York Power Authority and Shashank Sane, who is EVP of Transmission Development for Invenergy. Uh, welcome all, and I'll let you take it away from here. Great, thank you very much, Chris. So thank you again for having us. We are so thrilled to have been designated by NYSERDA, and we are so appreciative to John and the rest of the Urban Green Council team for providing us an opportunity to um, use your platform to connect with your network and, and explain uh, what our project is all about and what we're trying to do. Uh, this project is called Clean Path New York. Uh, and as Chris outlined, we were recently designated by NYSERDA for a tier four uh, award under their new large scale renewable program. So our uh, project team is comprised of uh, three partner organizations. Um, 
And so, Phil, maybe you could introduce yourself and, and NIPA. I'm sure all the, although I'm sure everybody knows what knows about NIPA. Sure. Thanks, Luke. Glad to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Phil Toy. I'm president of development for the New York Power Authority. Uh, NIPA is the largest state public power um, organization in the nation. Uh, we're celebrating our 90th uh, year um, this year in, in 2021. Um, we have uh, large generating facilities throughout the state. 80% um, of our energy is generated with clean, renewable hydro, and we have over 1,400 circuit miles of transmission. So, um, you know, glad to be here and uh, looking forward to the uh, presentation and questions. Thank you. Shank. Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. Shashank Sane here from Invenergy. I'm the Executive Vice President of Transmission uh, at Invenergy. Uh, first off, thank you to Urban Green for hosting us today. Uh, excited to be here and talk about our project. Uh, Invenergy is the largest privately held developer of clean energy uh, projects in the country. We've developed over 27,000 megawatts of wind, solar, battery storage, transmission, and other clean energy projects since the company's founding uh, almost exactly 20 years ago. We've also had a significant presence in New York State for uh, really most of our history, uh, developing our first project in the, in the state in the mid-2000s that entered operations in uh, 2008. So we've had a, a long history in New York with our wind, solar, and storage portfolios and look forward to continuing that with CleanPath. Great. And my name's Luke Falk. I'm with Energy Re. Uh, Energy Re is an independent New York company focused on solving complex challenges and providing clean energy solutions. Uh, we have deep expertise in infrastructure, engineering, real estate, um, by virtue of it being founded by the principles of the related companies, uh, which many of you probably know from our real estate practice in New York and elsewhere. Uh, and so I don't need to set the policy context. Chris really did a great job of framing that up. Uh, so what is our project? Um, our response to um, how you achieve the goals of 70 by 30 and 20 by 40 um, while solving historic congestion on the bulk power system across Total East and, and other interfaces is to develop 175 mile, 1300 megawatt, uh, all underground or underwater HBDC transmission link um, that connects Delhi, New York in the Western Catskills uh, with the borough of Queens. Uh, we couple that development with um, 3800 megawatts of new additional uh, wind and solar resources that are scattered throughout the state uh, that Shashank will speak to in, in greater depth. Uh, but on the transmission side, our project is a three and a half billion dollar investment. And on the generation side, the portfolio uh, represents a seven and a half billion dollar investment. So um, it can't be overstated um, how huge of an of a ambitious project this is. Um, it's got to be among, if not the largest investment in clean energy infrastructure in a single gesture uh, ever undertaken in the country. Um, and we're just so thrilled about it. When you bring that much clean energy online uh, and you deliver it into Zone J, um, it has a ripple effect across the state's electric system. So it doesn't just have impacts in New York City. Um, the impact goes beyond the five boroughs, and it w w manifests in a reduction in overall fossil fuel fire generation across the state on the order of 22% per year, um, which is just, it, again, can't be overstated how impactful that will be. Um, because everything we're doing is in New York, all the generation projects are developed within the state. The transmission is fully contained within the state. Uh, we create 8,300 jobs, um, all of which are located in the state. When you reduce fossil fuel fire generation that intensely, um, there is a huge associated reductions in emissions um, that are felt by frontline communities and, and others all throughout the state, um, which we think has an economic impact on the order of billions of dollars over the contract tenor in avoided and social public health expenses. 
environmental justice um, is really at the heart of what we're trying to do. It's really, you know, we all talk about climate and, you know, obviously it's a huge existential threat to everything everyone is trying to do. But transitioning to the new clean energy economy is going to be felt acutely among frontline communities who have for too long borne the burden of our fossil fuel economy. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Phil to talk a little bit about the route and, and some of our storage assets. So take it away, Phil. Great. Thanks, Luke. Uh, yeah, as Luke indicated, um, we'll be constructing a, a new high voltage DC line um, from uh, interconnecting at the Fraser substation uh, near Delhi, New York. Um, it's uh, about 175 miles of, of new line, um, all underground and uh, submarine. 105 miles of that 175 miles will be constructed in existing NIPA right away. So a great utilization of, of an existing asset and getting more out of the uh, current um, infrastructure, if you will, uh, from that existing right away. Um, like I said, entirely underground or um, underwater. Um, once we leave NIPA's right away near the Rock Tavern substation, um, it will be traversing uh, public rights away um, on roads um, and then entering the Hudson and eventually Harlem Rivers will be routing that. Now the current routing plan, um, again, we'll have to go through the Article 7 process in New York, but we've looked at that routing to um, minimize any impacts from an environmental standpoint. Uh, minimizing uh, community impact as well as uh, minimizing the project expense as much as possible from that routing. So uh, that's a, an overview of the high voltage DC line interconnecting um, in the Astoria area and then eventually into the rainy 345 KV substation in New York City. Next slide, please. Um, another great aspect here, again, following on the theme of utilizing existing resources, uh, we will be utilizing NIPA's uh, Blenheim Gilboa pump storage facility um, in, in Schoharie County uh, to help optimize utilization of the renewable resources uh, to, to help address some of the intermittency problems. Um, that facility has been in existence from 1973. Uh, and again, long-term uh, storage here with, with the Blenheim Gilboa facility, um, helping balance the uh, utilization of the line and the uh, renewables as well as uh, meeting the load uh, in New York City. Uh, and again, the utilization of the facility, um, we will meet all of our current obligations and requirements in the New York ISO market for operation of that facility. This is really incremental utilization, uh, help get additional utilization out of the existing facility. And, and again, with minimal impact because uh, this is an existing facility um, hydroelectric pump storage, and, and it's uh, utilizing that resource to uh, improve the operations. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Phil. So as we think about the generation portfolio here, we were very strategic in, in putting that portfolio together. What we've ended up with is a 3,800 megawatt portfolio of re renewable uh, generation resources, all located in the state of New York. The key in, in how we selected that was really to find a diversified, balanced portfolio of resources. So as you'll see here, we have a portfolio that's roughly evenly distributed between wind and solar resources and very well distributed throughout the state. So in terms of a, a geographically and technologically diverse portfolio, it's really as strong of a portfolio as you could assemble within the state of New York. The, the goal in, in putting the portfolio together was really to maximize the utilization of the transmission line and deliver as much renewable energy into New York City as we could. And we think we've accomplished that with uh, the portfolio that we've, we've uh, assembled here, particularly when paired with the Blenheim Gilboa uh, storage resource that uh, Phil was just talking about. You know, the, this portfolio of resources will really be able to deliver the maximum amount of renewable energy into New York City with an all New York solution. The other part that was important in assembling this portfolio was to make sure that the resources were uh, advanced in their development stage. So a number of these projects have gone through, you know, their permitting process, have land rights, and will actually be entering construction in the, in the relatively near future. 
Uh, but with all of the projects, you know, we're very confident that they'll uh, work through the processes that they need to uh, at the state and local level and ultimately end up uh, in, in construction and operations on the timeline of the project. So you know, we're very excited about the portfolio of resources and the transmission line um, proposal that we put together. But really the goal and what we're most excited about is the impact that we'll bring to New York State. And first off, as we think about the impacts, it's, it's about emissions and, and the goals of the CLCPA. So we talked about the renewable portfolio that, that we've assembled here, but the key is really to not just build the renewable resources, but bring them to where they're needed. And that's what the transmission line really does and what, what, what it will allow us to accomplish is bringing that renewable energy into New York City. What bringing that energy to where it's needed does is it allows for the reduction in, in the dispatch of fossil fuel uh, generation projects and a 22% statewide uh, reduction in emissions from fossil generators. That's the equivalent of 39 million car of avoided tons of CO2 um, just over the, the life of the contract of the project, not even in, incorporating the full life of uh, all of these assets. The other key element here is the economic development that this will bring. As Luke uh, discussed earlier, this is really one of the, if not the biggest, renewable award in the history of the country and certainly in the history of New York State. In total, it entails $11 billion of economic development, all located within New York State. The jobs that are associated with this project are significant, uh, diverse throughout the state, and, um, and long-lasting. So in total, there will be 8,300 jobs in the first three years of uh, construction operations, but there will be long-lived jobs as well through the operations of all these projects within the state. The other important part here is that while we talk about it as a 25-year contract with NYSERDA, the assets that we're building here in New York are very long-lived. On the, the wind and solar uh, facilities, those are 35, 40 year assets. And the transmission line in particular is a 70 year or more asset that, it, that will be an asset of New York State of NYPA after the contract term. And finally, we're very focused on working with our labor partners, uh, our union labor partners for the parts of this project that are being enabled by the tier four contract. We look forward to engaging with the labor community and, and working with them to build this very significant project in the state. Great. And so, you know, I think the final uh, portion of our prepared remarks today will focus on um, how we think about environmental justice and, and how our project lines up with um, the goals set forth in the CLCPA. So, as many of you are probably aware, um, there is uh, an ambition under the CLCPA to direct 40% of the benefit of spend on clean energy programs to frontline communities um, in recognition of the fact that those communities have borne um, a disproportionate share of the burden of enabling our fossil fuel economy and that we should try to right that wrong moving forward, which we fully uh, are aligned with. And so how do we think about that? Well, there, we think about benefits in two ways. There's direct investment, and then there's sort of the natural beneficial consequences that, um, that arise out of enabling a project of this scale and with its natural effect. And so we look at um, the direct investments that we make in the construction and operation of both generation and transmission, um, and we try to line that activity up with the geographic boundaries that uh, we think will be set under the CLCPA for where frontline communities will be located across the state. Um, and then we also look at the directly induced supply chain effects of that construction and operation. So goods and services provided in support of that effort and where those um, investments are made and where that activity is occurring. Um, and then we constitute a community investment fund to supplement all of that sort of natural um, action of the project. Um, I'll talk about the community investment fund a little bit more on the next slide. Um, but just to round out the, the story, not only are we going to look at where these investments occur um, 
but we're going to have a keen focus on prioritizing um, MWBE and, and other participants um, in, in an inclusive workforce where we try to build pathways uh, and linkages uh, from frontline communities uh, into what we're trying to do on the project level. So then you have sort of the natural benefits of the project and um, that could be emissions reductions uh, like we talked about before. Uh, it could be potential ratepayer savings, although um, it's sort of hard to forecast in a way. Um, it could be climate change mitigation impacts. Um, there could be several natural benefits that accrue to communities because of what we're trying to do. Uh, and we think overall that we are well positioned to make good on um, the ambition of the law. In terms of the community investment fund itself, um, we are committing to constituting a $270 million community investment fund, which uh, is going to be animated around four broad pillars of engagement. So you have a focus on workforce development and enabling the just transition um, to the new clean energy economy. Um, we need workers to uh, enable these outcomes. We need to serve, we need to be able to leverage our project and its scale as sort of a force multiplier to, um, you know, add velocity to the longstanding efforts by NYSERDAs and, and, and others in the space who have focused on workforce development for a long time um, to really create pathways and linkages that are meaningful for members of frontline communities to get involved in what we're trying to do. Um, then we have a focus on education because, you know, the next generation uh, coming up needs to be um, understanding matters associated with climate justice, with uh, the opportunities that the clean energy economy is going to afford us all. Um, and so that's a focus on primary and secondary education programs as well as continuing education, which again sort of bleeds into this overall workforce development initiative writ large. Um, then we think it's important to have a focus on expanding access to health care in frontline communities, um, knowing that, uh, you know, like we've, I've said three times already, that they've borne a disproportionate burden um, historically. Um, you know, one note that I, I didn't get explicitly into on the emissions story is that um, although we reduce a ton of, car like 39 million tons of carbon, um, it should be said that uh, we reduce uh, between 20 and 22 percent of all of the NOx, SOx, and particulate matter pollution uh, coming from the electric sector uh, by virtue of enabling our project. So PM especially is um, a nefarious pollutant that is linked to a host of deleterious social impacts. So um, just worth calling out um, in its own right. Uh, the, but the final piece of the community investment story uh, is around environmental conservation um, and, and stewardship. And so because of the geographic diversity of our project, we have a, a footprint upstate, we have a footprint um, going all the way down into New York City. This might look different depending on jurisdiction. It could be like traditional land conservation and expanding recreation opportunities upstate. It could be fishery habitat restoration uh, in, in the Hudson. It could be um, parks uh, and recreation activities in urban areas uh, or and or a focus on um, retrofitting affordable housing for electrification, which we all know has a positive sort of virtuous cycle of reinvestment in the community and workforce development opportunities in its own right. And the final thought here is that uh, we think uh, this is going to be governed by a board of directors comprised of project participants like us, as well as community representatives who can help us understand who should be allocated funding for what purpose um, to what degree and what KPIs we can use to measure the success of that effort. Um, and so before we close our remarks, I thought I'd turn it over to Shashank to just speak broadly around process and timeline uh, before we hand it back for questions. Thanks, Luke. So the uh, first 
uh, next step here is that NYSERDA will be taking the contracts uh, that have been awarded for approval with the Public Service Commission. So uh, you know, certainly uh, they'll be leading that process with the commission. But really, as it pertains to the uh, pieces of the Clean Path portfolio, um, there's a couple separate tracks. First, on the transmission line, the key activity will be uh, developing our Article 7 plan and submitting that next year. That'll entail a uh, significant stakeholder outreach over the next 12 months uh, and throughout that process uh, as we finalize the route and construction plan. Uh, and then on the uh, generation project side, the wind and solar side, uh, as I mentioned, a number of those projects are very well advanced and will actually be starting construction uh, imminently. Uh, and for the projects that are earlier in their life cycles, we'll also be going through the state and local permitting processes um, and looking to start construction in the next couple of years all with the goal of the project coming together and entering service in mid-2027. So that would be when all of the generation or the wind and solar resources and the transmission line are up and running and delivering fully uh, the renewable energy into New York City. Okay, so uh, thank you, Urban Green. Great, well, uh, thanks to uh panel. Uh, appreciate uh, your overview and comments. Uh, for the audience, uh, please, we've got a lot of good questions coming in. Please use uh, the Slido function to uh, submit your questions and we'll get to um, as many as we can. So let's uh, jump right into it. Um, so the question here about kind of the geography of uh, the projects. So are any of the power generation projects in New York City and maybe um, you can take that question a little bit more broadly and talk about, you know, what are the siting requirements for these projects? Give us a sense for like how much land is needed. Um, so we have a, a sense for scale on that. Yeah, why don't I uh, lead off with that one? So uh, we, we don't have New York City um, cited projects you know, within the portfolio here. And, and really the reason, as John, you're alluding to, is just the land requirements for a major wind or, or solar facility. Uh, the, there just isn't the space you know, available in New York City to develop uh, a large scale wind or solar facility uh, of the, the size that we're talking about in this portfolio. Um, you know, in, in the context of the solar projects, we're talking about thousands of acres and the wind projects, tens of thousands of acres. And as you can imagine, you know, those sorts of tracts of land just aren't available uh, in New York City. So that's really the, the main criteria that's driving the portfolio to be upstate oriented. And then maybe just a follow on uh, to that, Shashank. Um, do you have to do land acquisition first as part of this project or are these on... Um, lands that have already been acquired. Can you give us a sense for the complexity of just that piece of the equation? Yep, uh, it's it's a mix. So with certain of the wind and solar projects, we have uh, completed the land acquisition activities. Uh, with others, we're you know, in, in the midst of it. So uh, the, the sites that were selected were all selected because of our confidence in being able to acquire all the land necessary to, uh, to construct those. Uh, but just given the the various development life cycles of each project, in some cases we're complete, in some cases we're in the middle of it. And then in total on this issue, because I, I just find it fascinating, about how much acreage do you think in total um, will be part of this project to generate this massive amount of clean energy? It's a good question. I actually haven't uh, summed it up across all the projects, but uh, maybe we can follow up on that one. But we're, yeah, we're talking about a very large amount of land. Great. Thank you. Um, next question here, um, which is actually was going to be my question, which is once the high voltage uh, power is delivered to Queens, how will it get evenly distributed to other New York City substations? I don't know. Maybe Phil, you want to take that one? Yeah, so the high voltage DC um, is a controllable uh, transmission line. So it would be controlled from the standpoint of getting the withdrawal for, from upstate and injecting it into New York City. But once it hits the, the New York City grid, um, it's really based on the, the physics of the flow. Um, it will just be integrated within the existing AC network within, within New York City, um, and it'll flow to, to meet the loads um, at any individual substation that you know at that point has the demand yeah the, the one point i would just add to that uh the 
point of interconnection that we chose in New York City is a substation called Rainy. Um, the reason that we chose that one is to ensure that the, the energy from our project gets distributed as broadly within New York City or as impactfully, I should say, uh, within New York City as possible. Um, so there are you know, a number of different uh, substations that we could interconnect to, but we were very strategic in the point that we selected to have the maximum impact on the city. So give us a sense for that. Is this literally just plug and play or, or are investments needed at the substation? I take it as an existing substation. So does anything have to happen there or do you literally just run the cable in there and we go? Uh, I mean, I so there's there's basically like two levels of, of potential upgrades that you need to make. One is, do you have the, the space in the substation to plug the wire into the substation itself? Um, and then there are a series of um, upgrades that may need to be made um, down upstream or downstream, depending on how you think about it, from the substation itself um, to enable the flow of energy all around. And that determination is made through a process that you undertake with the New York independent system operator called the class year uh, process. And it is through that process and evaluation that it's determined um, what other enhancements need to be made to the system to, to make sure everything works correctly. Got it. Here's another question. How are underwater transmission lines installed? Bill, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, they're, they're special cable laying vessels, which are, are um, employed to, to lay the cable. Um, and of course, through the Article 7 process and all of the environmental reviews, um, any sort of appropriate uh, depth or um, you know, sensitive areas are, are taken into account in that. But it's a, it's a, a, a vessel that's utilized to, to lay that cable. Got it. Um, and give us a sense for how how big or how wide this cable is. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the the cable itself is uh, probably a sort of a coffee coaster, a little bit bigger than a coffee coaster. It's uh, amazing how uh, small of a cable you need to transmit this much power. Um, we'll have two of those conductors. We call the wire a conductor. Um, and depending where it's buried, it may have uh, be encased in conduit, it may be encased in duct bank um, or not. Great, thank you. Is there a, a WMBE requirement in your project or explain how that works? Um, uh, Luke, you got into some of the environmental justice issues, but how does that work from a actual a, a contracting and installation standpoint? Yeah, I mean, we're gonna do, uh, we're going to prioritize our um, communication with and um, activities with MWBE firms and, and others um, who are called out as, as um, being especially important to um, include in what we're trying to do. Next question here, we, and we've got some people ready to help. They say, how can, how can, how we, how can we help to install these projects? But maybe take the um, answer to that for sure, but take it a little broader is like, when do you actually see the work starting and what stages do you see uh, the project unfolding? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really going to be a, a continuous program of construction over the next several years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, certain of the wind and solar projects are imminently starting construction um, and more of them will basically be starting construction every year for the next few years. Uh, on the, the transmission line, obviously we need to get through the Article 7 process and some of the other development milestones. So we're probably still, you know, two, three years away from um, from starting construction there. But, you know, really what, what I'm most excited about is that we've, you know, we've got five years of uh, construction work to be done in, in New York State on various elements of these projects. And so there is going to be a, a continuous pipeline of work to be done on the construction side. And the other part I'll, I'll note is that even before we get to construction, you know, there's a lot of work to be done um, uh, in, in terms of consulting resources and, and things like that. So uh, we're you know open to working with all 
all partners uh, on the project. And so, um, you know, we can certainly get out more information about how to, how to work with us, but there is going to be a, a constant stream of work to be done here. Yeah. And in terms of like, if the question was intended to be, how can, how can individual participants be supportive of the effort, you know, as uh, Chris alluded to in the framing, there's going to be a public comment period before the public service commission um, around approving um, these projects to begin to move forward through the proper permitting process under Article 7. Um, anybody who's supportive of the project should take the opportunity to have their voice be heard and support. Um, and, you know, we're always uh, open and available to, to talk with interested people about how we can mobilize um, everybody toward our vision because you know, coming from a planning background myself, I think that one of the most important elements in, in large projects is really being able to amass a, a broad coalition of supported, supportive parties um, that are bought in and invested uh, into the wisdom of around what is trying to be accomplished through these endeavors. Several questions here. I'm trying to group them um, as a follow on to that on your the community investment fund and the workforce development and education. Can you speak a little bit more on how you envision that working and when you see that starting and the 270 million is that uh, from now until 2027 or like what, what's what's the timing on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So I mean, um, you know. I think the way that we, we envision it working is that we're going to um, start mobilizing the fund during the development period of the project. Um, and then we envision it having active um, outcomes uh, and ongoing operations throughout the life of the project. So what we don't want to do is just front load all of it and then um, make it feel like we were participating with communities at the outset of the project, but then um, left town thereafter. This is a 25 year engagement and we wanna be good corporate stewards. So we're, we're going to be an active participant in these communities um, over the long-term life of the project. Um, but again, we think that it's gonna be governed by a board of directors who, can, who is comprised of community participants um, that can help inform our understanding of um, what needs attention, what would be the most effective means of enabling outcomes and who we should be working with as part of the effort. Thank you. Another question here about battery storage, and I know you touched on it a little bit. So direct question is, you know, is battery storage part of your plan? Maybe you can expand on that, but I'd like to also expand the question itself and just to talk about what resiliency considerations do you think you have to factor um, for this project? Maybe I can start yeah. off and Phil, uh, Luke jump in. So uh, we don't currently have battery storage within the portfolio. Um, as Phil talked about earlier, the key storage resource here is the Blenheim Gaboa uh, pump storage facility, which we think has uh, a number of advantages relative to a battery storage option, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, partly is just the size and the scale of the pump storage facility, you know, talking about 1100 megawatts and uh, uh, what is it filled 12,000 megawatt hours, um, something like About that. 12,000 on a day, yeah. Um, which is, you know, of a scale that you just don't see in battery storage, uh, at least in the current state of the world. And so the ability to really firm up um, a portfolio of resources of the scale that we're talking about is best served with that pump storage facility. Not to say that we won't be evaluating opportunities to integrate battery storage into the projects on an ongoing basis. You know, we'll be continually, continually looking to optimize uh, the portfolio as we as we go along. On the point of resilience, I think you know an, an important point to mention here that maybe we didn't talk about uh, as much as we should have is the transmission line itself and the, the, the benefit that brings to the state from a, a resilience perspective. So um, the line itself will connect, you know, the Fraser substation upstate into New York City. And while the primary purpose of that will be to flow the renewables from upstate into the city, it is a resource of 
uh, the New York ISO. And New York ISO will determine what is the best use of that resource at any given time. And the primary purpose of New York ISO is to ensure system reliability. And so if the transmission line can be beneficial in, in ensuring the reliability of the overall New York ISO system, it will be, it will be used for that. And in general, you know, having additional pathways for energy to move around the state is hugely beneficial for the reliability and resilience of the overall system. Yeah, and just to, to add to that, so um, I'll start with the storage piece. I mean, Shashank was correct. You know, again, utilizing an existing resource to get more utilization out of it. Uh, the Blenheim Gilboa facility is, um, if you will, just one substation removed from Fraser. So there is a you know a direct connection to get the energy to the high voltage DC line. Um, the line being underground and, and submarine will add to resiliency as well um, to help with, uh, you know, any storm related issues. Um, and, and then lastly, I think the important point here is, um, you know, a couple things. One is just, and, and Shashank talked about this, that geographic diversity of the renewable resources upstate um, helps with that, that resiliency. And, and then the last thing, and you touched upon it earlier on, um, you know, that the tail of two grids that the, our transmission line does bridge that interface. So it, it does um, help relieve that um, historical congestion uh, that's been present in New York State. Great. So we have time for one more questions. We had a ton of questions. So I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Maybe we can at the back end of the program um, come back to them. Um, so I, I think I'll end on the uh, interesting question here. Um, the questioner is asking, will there be any off takers for the energy before it gets to New York? So the question is, you know, will 100% of this power be coming to New York or will some of it also be serving upstate New York regions? Yeah, yeah, maybe I could, you, I'll start with this one. Okay. So, I mean, so when you just look at the numbers, we have 3,800 megawatts of wind and solar and the capacity of the transmission resource is 1,300. So we're overbuilding renewables relative to the capacity of the transmission line. Um, we do that given the intermittency of renewables and you know the way that you need to plan over the course of a year for it to be as highly utilized as possible. But there are going to be times of the day when we're making more power than we can um, deliver down into the city over the transmission. And in those circumstances, power will flow into the local grid for use by upstate communities um, and or be sent over to Blenheim Gilboa to be stored in the pump storage facility that we talked about. Um, but everything flowing over the line will be delivered into New York City. And that power will be sold to the New York independent system operator so that it's broadly distributed across um, Con Ed network, right? It's not gonna be sold to individuals via bilaterals. It's going to be sold onto the wholesale market for energy. Great, well, thank you. We've come to the end of our time for questions for this panel. So Luke and Shawshank and Phil, I really appreciate the time uh, you spent with us today. Um, and so let's move on to um, our second panel, which is the Champlain Hudson uh, Power Express. Um, and I'm pleased, let's see if we can get the cameras on. Um, so I'm pleased to welcome uh, Don Jessom, who's the president and CEO of Transmission Developers, and Dave Riom, who's the senior director of development strategy and commercial relations outside of Quebec for Hydro Quebec. So Don and Dave. Um, welcome to the program. Uh, we'll turn it over to you uh, for your presentation. Uh, for those uh, in the audience, um, switch gears and um, uh, listen to uh, the, the great presentations are going to come, and we'll look for your questions uh, in about 20 minutes uh, and we'll go through those. So, Don and Dave, over to you. Thank you, John. Hi, my name is Don Jessam. I am uh, CEO of Transmission Developers. I'm very pleased to, uh, to speak to the audience today about the uh, Champlain Hudson Power Express project, um, along with our partner Hydro Quebec, who will be supplying the power for this project. Um, we're very excited to be able to speak to the audience today to talk a little bit about what, we're, what we've been up to and where our project is, is heading. Some of the material we'll be covering uh, has already been covered, but I, I think it's so important to um, to, to just give everybody a good background. 
I'll, I'll go through it uh, fairly quickly, but it's, uh, I think it's really important to understand uh, how we got to this point. So on CLCPA, uh, Chris had spoken to this earlier uh, with respect to um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, but it, it's really critical to this, this whole story. You, you have um, you know, 20, 30 goals of 70% reduction uh, in the uh, power grid and 2040 goals of 100% uh, zero emission electricity. So it's, it's just an incredible uh, nation leading uh, uh, act that is driving a lot of the activity that's going on, the very exciting activity that's going on in the renewable space today. And uh, with that, uh, NYSERDA and the PSC, and this has been previously mentioned, they came up with a, a new, what's called tier four rec program. And, and why did they come up with that? Well, well they did the math. They, they looked through uh, the existing programs, both for onshore wind, for offshore wind, for solar, for storage, and if you look at the total um, energy that's required in New York State for any given year, it's about 150 terawatt hours. And if you take 70% of that, you're at about 106 terawatt hours. And at this point in time, that, that's the existing programs, you'd be short about 25 terawatt hours a year. And also, as mentioned previously, one of the critical areas that uh, the state is trying to achieve is to get as much renewable into the load center as possible. And so uh, the PSC and, and NYSERDA really focused on this new REC program for this 25 terawatt hours of energy, and you have to deliver it into the city. And it's critical it's being delivered into the city because that's where the load center is. We've seen this slide before, but I think it's, it's worth emphasizing the tale of two grids. And again, this is the, the NISO's um, analysis looking at the upstate versus downstate. I had just mentioned the fact that um, the tier four rec program is very focused on getting the um, downstate area much more renewable than it is today. So before Indian Point closed, it was around 77% uh, was fossil uh, generation. But since Indian Point has closed, it's now approximately 85%. So, so the problem was getting worse. And on top of that, we had uh, already heard from um, clean path, the, the issue with trying to get this energy into the downstate area. It's been a, it's been a problem for many decades. You, you really need to be able to get new transmission into the downstate area to be able to deliver the clean energy. It's, it's just not sufficient to be able to build it upstate without the uh, added transmission to be able to bring the energy downstate. So you, so you need the combination of the clean energy and the transmission connecting into the um, what we call Zone J or New York City market. And just as an interesting aside, Hydro Quebec currently today is producing about twenty percent of New York State's renewable energy. So our partner, who is going to be supplying the hydro and wind power for this project, is currently one of the largest contributors to upstate New York's. Um, renewable energy at this point in time. And they've been partners with New York State for close to 100 years. On the tier four program, we've heard about this, but just uh, it's good to reemphasize that, you know, back in October, the Public Service Commission established the tier four uh, REC program to e increase the penetration of renewable energy into New York City, very specifically designed uh, to increase that penetration to New York City. In January, we had the request for proposals. And in the September of this year, two projects out of the seven bids were selected from a very competitive process. And those two projects, of course, are CHPE and our, um, the other project being Clean Path, who we just heard from uh, on their very exciting project as well. And th these are very large scale, um, game changing um, projects for New York State. You know, over 10,000 family sustaining jobs created statewide from these two projects, 8.2 billion in economic development uh, and investments. These are, these are going to be game changing in order for New York to make the transition under CLCPA that it's trying to achieve to, uh, to obtain these goals of 70% by 2030 and 100% by 2040. And if you look, you know, Energy projects take a long time to get permitted and to get built. 
and 2030 and 2040 are not that far away. So having selected these two projects at this point in time is going to ensure that the state achieves these goals. So let me talk a little bit specifically about the Champlain Hudson Power Express project. So we're a 1250 megawatt project. And to put that in perspective, that's about 1.2, about 12, 1.25 million uh, homes. Uh, so it's, it's a fairly significant amount of energy or about 20% of New York City's energy needs. We're 10.4 terawatt hours a year of clean energy. And that is because we are connected to Hydro-Quebec's hydro system, that, that is about 95% utilization of this line. So 24 seven, 365 days of the year, this line is gonna be delivering 1250 megawatts of clean energy into New York, into, uh, New York City. Uh, this is not an intermittent resource in that uh, Hydro-Quebec has the storage to be able to deliver um, at, at 95 or higher percent capacity factor on this line. So it's a, it's a very high utilization transmission line. We're 339 miles from the Canadian borders to Queens. So all the way up from Rouse's Point into Astoria where we interconnect to the Astoria complex is the uh, transmission project. Approximately 60% of that is in waterways. So Lake Champlain, Hudson, Harlem River, and the other 40% uh, were along railroad rights of way and <coughs> city streets. So these are all um, rights of way that are already existing today, and we're gonna be able to utilize uh, those existing rights of way. Uh, we're fully permitted. So we've gone through our Article 7, our presidential permit and Army Corps permits, which are required uh, in order to site this project, uh, both on land and water. And we will be uh, able to begin construction starting in 2022. And as previously mentioned, we're all waiting for the um, contracts to be filed with the Public Service Commission. And if the Public Service Commission does approve the contracts, uh, we would be able to start early in 2022. And that allows us to be in service by 2025. So we're uh, very anxious to get this project started and to be able to start delivering uh, energy into the city as early as 2025. As previously mentioned, transmission projects in particular are very long-term assets. So although the contract with NYSERDA is for 25 years, this is a 60 plus year uh, project in terms of the uh, expected life of this transmission line. And it's probably much longer than that. These, these lines are inert. Uh, they're, there's, um, you know, once buried, put into uh, service, uh, they really have a very long-term life. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the opportunities that could uh, present themselves over the very uh, long-term uh, aspect of this project. We've worked very hard over the years to get as much support as we can from uh, various NGOs, environmental groups, labor unions, uh, certainly with the business community, we work very closely work with, and of course, local communities. I mean, we're traversing uh, the entire state of New York uh, from end to end. And so we've been working with um, many, many communities over the years. And we have uh, 36 municipalities passing resolutions of support for the project. So very uh, pleased to have been working so closely with these local communities and they see the benefits of the project, both for, for their uh, local, from local perspective, but also um, from a wider perspective of the uh, GHG and clean energy aspects of the project. So some of the key benefits to the CHPE project, it's gonna be one of the largest private investments in New York State's history uh, from a clean energy perspective with over three and a half billion dollars in uh, direct New York expenditures over the first 25 years of the project. As mentioned on the local uh, community perspective, uh, there's $1.4 billion of new property taxes over 150 communities. Again, that's over the first 25 years of this project. We've established a $40 million green economy fund, which uh, Dave will be speaking a little bit more about here in a few minutes. But this is uh, really uh, an important aspect of this project and very excited about um, uh, establishing that new fund. We also have a $117 million uh, enhancement restoration and research uh, improvement trust fund that's been established uh, for many years now. And its uh, primary goal of this trust fund is to invest in the uh, waterways in terms of 
looking at different uh, studies that can be performed to, uh, in the Hudson, Harlem, and uh, Lake Champlain. So we have a board that's already been established and they've been uh, meeting for several years. We have a, an administrator who's already established uh, in that uh, trust fund as well. And those projects would be able to start uh, as early as 2022 uh, when we uh, uh, start construction of the project. I previously mentioned the 10.4 terawatt hours of base load power. We think that's an incredibly important piece to this project. Uh, from a reliability uh, perspective, obviously the, the more base load the, the uh, power is, uh, it, it's, it just enhances the reliability of the entire system. And as we are transitioning to a more um, clean um, grid, there, there is gonna be a combination of this base load power and intermittent uh, resources. And the combination of the two uh, actually enhance one another. And certainly from a, a NISO perspective, having um, both the base load and the intermittent uh, working together, we think that that's just a, a great combination. And to put it in perspective, we're about half of the capacity of uh, Indian Point. During the construction period, so from 2022 to 2025, we're looking at about uh, 1,400 uh, new construction jobs. Uh, this is all organized labor. We've been working with um, the unions uh, for many, many years now. Uh, they've been a great supporter of this project and uh, we're very proud that they've been uh, uh, partners with us all the way along and uh, working very closely with them for the uh, project and look forward to getting those jobs started. And then uh, finally, I had mentioned previously that this is a, you know, much longer than a 25-year contract, this transmission system will be in place for 60 plus years. And one of the things that uh, we're very proud of is the fact that we're gonna be connecting to the Hydro Quebec uh, reservoir system. And if you think about how their system has developed over the years and where it sits today, and Dave will certainly talk a lot more about this, it's, it's one of the largest uh, seasonal battery storage facilities in the world. So we're not talking uh, seasonal storage, or we're not talking storage for a couple of hours a day. We're talking being, being able to take surplus renewables that could be generated in the winter months, which tend to be the um, largest um, uh, period of time where most energy is produced, store it up in the Quebec system, and then take it back in the summer months when New York City in particular is uh, peaking. So that ability to, to tap into that storage resource, we think is, is an incredibly uh, important piece to the project. Just wanted to talk, talk a little bit about environmental and social justice. Uh, we heard quite a bit about this uh, particular point and th this is a very uh, integral part of the CLCPA uh, and NYSERDA Tier 4 REC contract. We are actually connecting into the Astoria complex in Queens. So the Astoria complex has traditionally been a, an area where there's been a lot of fossil generation built in this, uh, in this community. And uh, we are gonna be uh, building our converter station where historically there has been uh, fossil generation. So this 1250 megawatts of clean energy at 95% capacity factor is going to be uh, displacing a large volume of uh, fossil generation. And we've had our economists uh, look at this and you know, of course CO2 is an important driver in all of this, um, these, these projects, but it's very much the local pollutants that we think are, are also equally important. And if you look at the NOx, the SOx and the particulate matter, uh, that we will be displacing, it's equivalent to uh, 15 of the of New York City's 16 uh, peaker plants. So a very, very localized um, benefit to the, to the community that we're gonna be serving as we interconnect into the uh, NISO grid. And also to put some of these, these numbers in perspective, because we're all throwing a lot of statistics at this audience, it's equivalent to about 44% of the cars from. Um, from New York City. So again, a very significant amount of clean energy that's gonna be displacing traditional fossil generation and uh, fossil pollutants. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dave. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, thank you uh, to the uh, Urban Green Council for, for having us over. It's, uh, it's always a little uh, nerve wracking for me to be making presentations in English. So uh, don't hesitate when you have questions, if there's anything that wasn't clear at the end 
uh, I'll gladly uh, clarify if my, my initial statements were not really understood. Um, so for uh, Don mentioned it a bit earlier, a green economy fund, a $40 million fund sponsored by uh, both the partners in this project. One of, I'd say the key features of this is uh, decarbonation of the economy, decarbonation of the grid is uh, having impacts on workers and communities. And, and uh, we're coming at this with a very humble approach. Um, we cannot know in advance all of the impacts. Some, some are very specific to some specific communities. Some are more general and they touch differently families and, and different class of workers. The goal is really to lean on NGOs and local business organization in order to tell us how to be spending this money. What's the, what's the most desired way to help the transition of the workforce in order to adapt to this uh, decarbonized economy? It could be very specific in terms of, of very specific training for a new trade, just like it may be funding daycare services to help to give time to, to workers and families to have more time to go and, and learn from this. So leaning on, on the, the local knowledge of the reality of the communities is, is essential in order to, to define how we're gonna be spending this. Um, most of the questions we usually get is what is the reality of Hydro-Quebec in terms of a uh, generation? Um, we are the biggest uh, renewable generation uh, company in North America. Uh, you see the map here uh, and, and most of the, the, the important information, 61 hydropower station, um, close to 40,000 megawatts of hydropower. And over the last uh, two decades, we've added uh, 5,000 megawatts of new hydropower generation in parallel with 4,000 megawatts of wind power. So we generate uh, per year, obviously it depends on the, the uh, hydrology inputs. Uh, the water flows, but uh, about 200 terawatt hour of, of energy every year. Uh, we have a very uh, important high voltage transmission system. A uh, few elements that I'd like to point out. So these are the, the, the public information you find uh, in, in most documents, but a few information that I believe is, is relevant from New York perspective. Um, as we try to decarbonize the grid, we're also trying to decarbonize our economy. And, and a big chunk of, of what will be a challenge in the next decades is how do we decarbonize the, the electric, uh, the, the heating system of the buildings? And Quebec is already having 80% of its population that uses electricity for heating. So a, a very positive view is the current surpluses we have are not gonna be taken by having to electrify the, the heating system in Quebec because it, it already is. Uh, obviously, we don't need to build new hydro in order to be providing uh, the energy for this uh, for this contract, and but we will be adding uh, 1,400 of uh, new wind as part of this. And one of the questions we often get asked is, can Quebec use uh, Ontario or or other Canadian provinces to purchase energy that may not be green in order to supply to New York? Well, it it couldn't work this way, both from the terms of the program, but also because Quebec is part of the Western Climate Initiative with other states such as California, and that when if we were to import energy that would not be green, we would have to pay a, a carbon tax uh, in order to compensate for this. Um, and, and one of the important aspects to bring is that we've been adding thousands of megawatts of new generation over the last decades, but we have not had it, any new transmission. So what this that is an opportunity for us to decarbonize our own province. But we, that's why we're in such a situation of surpluses right now, and we are being able to contribute significantly to decarbonation of, uh, of New York State. Um, with regards to the environmental impact of Quebec Hydro, well, our hydro is not impact-free. New generation assets do have an impact on the environment. We recognize that. Um, we've been doing study and, and life cycle assessment of what's the impact of Quebec's hydropower. You can, you can see some of the, uh, of the chart there. Quebec's hydropower, uh, hydropower has a slightly higher, but very slightly higher uh, GHG emissions than wind. We recognize that. But we believe we need to be looked at comparing with uh, the base load type of, of, uh, of, of generation. Um, we don't see ourselves as being in competition with wind and solar generation. 
if New York, uh, which we think it's a, it's, a, it's a great news of the Clean Path project being uh, taken, the more wind and, and solar that New York can add, the better. We, we truly are in favor of this. But we believe in order to tackle climate change, we also need to have some uh, lower GHG emission sources for base load replacement. And that's where we believe we fit in. So it, it's always at the center of our message. We're, we're not competing against wind and solar. Really, what we're trying to do is provide an alternative towards uh, a more higher uh, GHG emission uh, base load uh, sources. Uh, finally, uh, with regards to First Nation communities, that's a that's a that's a co- lot of questions we get about this. So we have 55 communities in Quebec. You see the map for uh, 11 different indigenous uh, nations. Uh, it's about one percent of the Quebec population, uh, mostly living in the northern areas. Um, we have over the years uh, concluded 40 agreements with uh, five indigenous nations. Um, we believe uh, that we're doing things better and better. Uh, the goal is to gain social acceptability for all of the projects we're doing. We're trying to do them in partnership to make sure that the wealth that is being generated for this project is being shared with the communities. Uh, most recently, uh, specifically in the context of, of this uh, CHP project, uh, we concluded two very uh, important agreements, one with the Inu communities that you see uh, uh, northeast uh, of Quebec for a 200 uh, megawatt wind farm project. So part of the four, uh, 1400 megawatt projects that we will have to put into service, 200 of those is coming in a partnership with the Inu community. And, uh, and, and also uh, we concluded a, an agreement for a partnership uh, for a joint ownership of the line on the Quebec side. So earlier you saw from down the, the line that goes from the border to New York City, but obviously we have to build as well a line on the, on the, on the Quebec side. And this line will be co-owned by the Mohawk uh, Council of Kanawaki uh, to share with them the benefits of this project over the 40 years uh, depreciation of, the, of this assets. So this is how we're trying to, to build our projects so to make sure that these, these new opportunities generate as well more wealth for the communities. Uh, finally, um, obviously we build these assets based on there's a customer that has a need, we're a supplier who has some surpluses. The goal is to have a commercial agreement that's work for everybody, but we truly believe that in the long run, as New York decarbonize itself, the, 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 the balancing of the peak uh, versus the periods of the of the year where you may be in over generation situation with even negative pricing, that's an added value we see in this. This project uh, will have the technological capacity to be bilat- bidirectional. We believe that we can use our reservoir and glad to answer questions about this in order to uh, maximize the decarbonation effect of this transmission line by by adding more and more renewables on the New York side. Uh, we decarbonize, but there will be some times where maybe you're in excess generation situation. We can, in those situations, lower our generation on our side, take your energy, so keep the water uh, behind uh, the, the reservoir for us, and add generation in the hours where there'll be lower uh, sun or lower wind type situation. So to us, this is really a win-win and something that we will see more and more value in the long run uh, over the next decades. Uh, thank you for, uh, for this and uh, glad to answer questions. Great, well, uh, Don and Dave, thank you very much uh, for the exciting presentation and um, the, all the investments that you're making uh, for clean energy future in New York. Jump into the questions again uh, for the audience. If uh, you can use the Slido link that's been provided, uh, we'll get to as many uh, questions as we can. Um, so Dave, lots of questions on um, First, Na- First Nations and you've addressed it, but maybe we can go into a little bit more, you know, questions around, you know, protections for First Nations population <laughs> on the environment, environmental justice considerations for First Nations. Maybe you can just talk to us a little bit more about those 40 agreements and the types of, issues that are considered um, in those agreements that, that you've done so far? Uh, thanks, John. Yes, um, uh, the, these agreements, and we, we actually announced a new one uh, just last week with the Etikemeka region in the, that's uh, in the middle of the province on the west side where these communities are located. Uh, that goes from 
every time we need to develop, and it applies to both transmission lines and generation, uh, how are we going to do the assessment? How, how are we going to be relying on their expertise and, and their people in order to be making these assessments and identifying in some cases, what are some of the impacts and how can we, we can mitigate this? So we see this as, as really a partnership. Currently, it's not realistic in the, in the Canadian and Quebec regulation would never allow you to be developing a project without uh, doing some consultation and trying to find some fair consensus with the communities in terms of mitigating the impact and sharing uh, the value of these projects. So anything from impact on the waterland, uh, impact on, on the fishing, uh, the, the hunting, uh, mitigation measures, test over sometimes decades to just keep tracking and getting a better knowledge in some cases of the impacts, these are all included as part of the of the agreements we, we were putting in place with the communities. Okay, thank you, um, Dave, for that. Um, next question here is actually one that I had is, um, how do you plan for potential impacts of climate change and hydro resources? So what is, um, you know, we, we understand that climate change, you know, brings droughts to some areas and surpluses to other areas. How, do, how does the climatology work, so to speak, uh, in Quebec when it comes to water? Sure. Um, uh, two things that I, well, one thing that I didn't mention and one thing to, to add to your answer. Um, the, the, when we calculate the impact, especially the GHG impact of our hydro, we really take real data in Quebec. Obviously, the, Quebec is a, is, a, is a cold province and most of our generation is in the northern part of the of the province, and therefore it has extremely cold water and that has a significant impact on the GG. So we're working with uh, international uh, 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 universities to make sure that we have the best data in order to assess correctly what is the impact. Currently with regards to uh, global, uh, global warming and, and environmental changes, what we see is an added volatility of the, the amount of water inflows but an added quantity of the water inflows. When you look at the long run uh, water inflows that we expect, it's growing. Currently, we have close to 200 terawatt hour of energy equivalent water in our reservoir. So almost a full year where if there was no water inputs at all, we could in theory be running a full year of supply for Quebec and our existing uh, uh, agreements outside of the province. So this allows us to deal with uh, consecutive years of very low water inflows in order to keep the security of supply of both Quebec and uh, neighboring jurisdiction with whom we have contracts. Thank you. Here's a question. I actually think it's a holdover from the last presentation, but it's, it's relevant here as well. You know, if the transmission assets going to serve decades and decades, um, why wouldn't we install greater transmission capacity to account for future expansion of renewable energy? So, why not more? Why, 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 quote unquote, just this, I think, is the, is the, is the question here. And maybe you can help talk through um, the bidding requirements that, that NYSERDA set forth on this and, um, you know, the considerations for, you know, how big the capacity uh, would be for this particular project. So sure, I, let, let, let me tell you a little bit about uh, CHPE. So when we first started this, developing this project, the uh, state-of-the-art technology was 1,000 megawatts. Uh, and, and since then, uh, the technology has improved to uh, the new state-of-the-art is 1,250 megawatts. And so we, we went back a couple of years ago to the Public Service Commission, to Department of Energy, to the Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, had all, all of our permits uh, upgraded to uh, to, to do exactly what uh, the audience uh, member just asked is well, why, why didn't we increase the size? So we did. So we went to the, uh, to the state of the art uh, technology at this point in time. There, there is a limit uh, as to how large you can make a, a project uh, in any given jurisdiction. And as we probably, uh, hopefully many of us don't remember back in the seventies when there were uh, significant uh, blackouts. Uh, it, the real reason was is that there wasn't a very good interconnection between the different systems and the reliability rules that are in place today were not in place then. So today they have what they have called the single largest contingency. So what you wanna make sure is that the system that's designed uh, 
whatever the, the largest piece of equipment is that comes out of service doesn't impact the system and have blackouts. So there is a theoretical limit as to how big these projects can get. We're kind of pushing up against it at this point in time, because if you look at the uh, single largest contingency in New York, it's I think it's around 1300 megawatts. So, so you, you have to be uh, cognizant of that uh, situation as well. Thank you. The um, next question here, again, about Rex, and we've talked about we really don't know yet. We'll have a future program understanding how Rex will flow, but maybe just generally a uh, question here, will commercial class Con Ed customers contract directly for this power um, and Rex, or will they do that through NYSERDA? I think this was addressed before, but tell us how, you know, how uh, buildings in New York are gonna access this power. So um, the, the power itself will be sold into the NISO grid. So uh, we connect you to Astoria. We actually also connect over to the rainy substation. So I think there was a previous question as to how do we make sure that as much of this energy can be delivered as possible. So we actually interconnect to two substations to, to be able to, um, to distribute the energy as, as widely as possible in, in uh, the city. So, um, all, every customer on the Con Ed system is going to have access to this power through the uh, through the NISO system. The the actual RECs themselves, um, they're they're going to be sold to uh, NYSERDA, and so NYSERDA will have have the RECs. But the actual physical energy will be delivered into the city. Um, commercial arrangements as to how you know individual buildings will be uh, buying the power. I, I, I guess we'll we'll wait and see how uh, different business models appear there. Great, and as uh, Chris Hafnay had mentioned, once the uh, path on Rex is clear, because there's a lot of rule making still to be done on that, we'll be following that closely at Urban Green and we'll provide future programming on uh, Rex as it relates to tier four. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, next question, what kind of uh, insulation is used on these transmission lines? Is it solid, is it oil, is it other? And maybe just to expand upon that just a little bit greater, is, frankly, what is the role of insulation on a line like that? So if you can see my picture, I'm holding up a, 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 a cable. So, so this is the physical size of the cable. Uh, this is copper. So this is where the electricity actually flows, where the power flows. Uh, the actual insulation is right here. This is called cross-link polyethylene. And what that is, it's a, a material that insulates the cable uh, from the outside world. And this, this here uh, has two additional pieces. This is, both of these pieces are steel. So this ring here is to protect the cable uh, during the installation process. And this is actually, I, I know that this is uh, in water uh, cable because it also has the extra layer here of armoring and that's steel armoring as well. And then it's wrapped out uh, in a, finally in a, uh, an additional um, material that's used as part of the insulation. But the primary insulation is this crosslink polyethylene, which is right here. And is the insulation for a safety purpose or is it for an efficiency purpose to trans to be able to transmit more power? It's a, it's a combination of both, uh, certainly from safety. You have to isolate it because this is at um, uh, 420,000 volts uh, HVDC. And so this is high voltage and um, uh, the current associated with that and 1250 megawatts of power. And then of course you, you have to have the steel reinforcement uh, during the installation process, this cable is, is fairly heavy. It's gonna be on large spools. You have to be able to move it. You have to uh, uh, put it uh, into uh, final locations. And so it's protected uh, with the uh, added steel reinforcement. Give us a sense for um, the, the timing for a project like this. So how long, like when did you start? How long did it take to get the, the full permitting that you've gone through? So, so we started development of this project back in 2010. Uh, we received our um, Article 7 certificate, which is the uh, State uh, Certificate of Public Need in 2013. We received our uh, presidential permit in 2014. Because, because we cross an international border, there's a, a, a full environmental uh, review process that takes place. And then in 2015, we received our Army Corps of Engineers permits. Because we're in um, navigable waterways, uh, there, there's a very extensive uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, permitting process that takes place as well. And so if you're, uh, you mentioned you'll be shovel ready next year, um, assuming that happens, remind us again when from this project the clean power will actually flow into New York? 
So uh, our plan right now is that we start in 2022 and we would be in service uh, by uh, Q4 of 2025. We'd actually be mechanically complete probably the summer of 2025. And then you have to go through a, a very extensive um, a permit or um, commissioning process uh, to just to make sure that everything is working as planned. Okay, great. We have time for one more question here. Um, there were some earlier questions about battery storage. How does that work? Is it really are you are you pumping energy there, or is it really um, um, a, a a reservoir? Pardon the pun of of capacity that's available to use. Uh, when needed. So explain that battery capability uh, for hydro. Uh, so, yeah, sure. Uh, it, it's a metaphor. It's, uh, there is no actual physical uh, batteries. What we mean when we say battery is instead of generating the energy by letting the water go through the turbine and then trying to store it in some kind of physical battery, what we can do is just keep the water behind the wall, like basically use the dam as a battery so when there is a high need for energy, we let more water go and generate more energy and we can, we can send it uh, in, in your zone. But when, let's assume that it's a very windy situation, there are high level of sun and low level of, of, of demand, there could be some hours where New York City does not need our energy. And in which case, what we can do is say, well, we don't need to spill this energy in, in a way that it's not efficient. We can just keep the water behind. So the so the reservoir really acts as a, as a battery. That, that's the metaphor we're using because we have the ability to decide when we want to let the water go through the turbine and what, just to match it exactly for when the energy is needed. So having so many generating stations gives us, if we had only had one, it would not necessarily be possible, but having this flexibility of the mix of, the, of all the stations allows us to provide a really, really, a service that can be base load, but through time can also be much more uh, uh, need surgical needs in terms of energy. Great, thank you. Well, we're at the uh, end of time for this panel. So uh, Dave and Don, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you for sharing the details on your exciting project. Thank you. Great. Well, um, I hope uh, the audience has enjoyed our program today. I, I take away uh, a big sense of hope here. This is $20 billion of real investment to decarbonize the grid in New York City. This is exactly the, project, the projects and the process and the outcomes that we were looking for when we think about how we get to a low carbon future in New York. And these projects are real, they're slated to go. Uh, and I'm so thrilled that both of them spent time uh, with our audience today uh, to review the details. And we'll see you at the next Urban Green program. Everybody have a great day.